chapter 24. I got to give Corin a little bit of credit on this. I always, uh, I always knew this verse was here, but I didn't know it was the first usage of the word heresy. That's a word that gets thrown out a lot, especially by people that don't want a, a, a true discussion. Just throw the word heretic out there, and then you don't have to take anybody serious, right? But... uh. Not everybody that disagrees with you is a heretic. Sometimes people disagree with you are right and you're wrong. Yeah. You just don't see it yet. You know how many times I've been there in my life? Been quite a few. And uh, But look here in Acts 24, back up in verse 10. Paul's been, if you go back to 20, you ain't got to go there, but if you've read this story, you know that Paul went back to Jerusalem he goes into the temple there and, you know, he's trying to, he's trying to live with a, with a good testimony to the conscience of the Jews and they, they just, they have it out for this man. And so they, they end up arresting him and delivering him there to the judges. And so what you're reading about here now is Paul, here in, in verse 9 or verse 10, it says, then Paul after that, the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because that thou, know, that, that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple, disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, nor in the synagogues, nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Now look at verse 14. But this I confess unto thee. I love this, man. I love this verse. So Paul's going to confess something to him. That after the way which they call what? So worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law, and in the prophets. You see that? You know that's the first usage of the word heresy. You know what it was? It was used by. It was used as slander. Against a man who worshipped God. By believing all that God had written. The word heresy was used there. For a slander against a Bible believer. Worshipping God. Okay. Now get that. Paul confesses it. He said, I conf he said, I confess to this. He said, these things they're accusing me of, they can't prove them. They didn't find me. I'm not guilty of any of those things, but I will confess this to you. That by, after the way they call heresy, I worship God. Believing all things that are written in the law and in the prophets. Paul was a Bible believer. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. This is Paul's confession. Look there. Look, read that verse again, verse 14. Read it again. Notice how Paul worshiped God. <laughs> you can't, I mean, it's, it's right there, it's hitting you right between the eyes. How did Paul worship God? Believing all things. Do you know that's how you worship God? Yes, sir. Yeah. Did y'all know that that's how you worship God? You worship God by reading and believing this book. Christ said, God is a spirit. Well, how do you worship a spirit? You must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, where are you going to get that? Right? You know how many people there are waving their hands this morning? You know how many people there are waving their hands this morning? That would spend 10 minutes in this church and call us heretics. Okay. I believe, that, I believe there's something different between something spoken since, since the beginning of the world and something kept secret since the beginning of the world. I believe that. I believe all things that are written. That makes me a heretic in the eyes of the religious world. Paul confesses to it. Now, I'm going to tell you something, man. The moment you try to worship God apart from that book, you become a pagan. 
The moment you worship God apart from reading and believing that book, you're just an idolater. I mean that. You're just going to start worshiping God in the way that you create him in your own mind. You can't worship God apart from believing, reading, and believing the book that he gave you. So you got two kinds of people in this world. You got a bunch of religious fanatics that don't know anything God actually said that are trying to worship God in churches this morning. And then you got people like me who believe all things that are written in that book. And you got, listen, you try to worship God apart from that book, you're a pagan. But the more you believe, read, and believe that book, the more the religious fanatics and the traditionalists of this world, including Baptist traditionalists, are going to start labeling you the heretic. There's never been a greater, there's never been a more, I'll tell you this, the people today that most resemble the sect of the Pharisees of Christ and Paul's time are the fundamental Baptists of today. They more closely resemble that group than anybody. They stand and point a finger. Everybody in the world. They put upon men heavy burdens. Will not lift them with one of their fingers. They strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. And listen, they point the finger at every crowd. And then they stand up there. We're closer to the truth than anybody. And I've had Baptist preachers visit this church, couldn't get out the back doors quick enough by the time I got done preaching. Because he realized he wasn't, it's what, listen man, you know what ran him out? Fear. That for 60 years all he had done is played a game. And let tradition and religious fanaticism run his life, and when it when confronted with ignorance of what God actually said, it scared him. Amen? But they're going to label you. They're going to label you, man. It, it, you, I mean, it don't bother me. You know what I'm going to do this morning? I'm going to preach this morning and confess to you why I'm a heretic. I'm going to confess to you this morning that after the way so many people call heresy is exactly the way I worship God. And the first one I'm going to talk to you about is I am a Bible-believing, King James Bible-believing heretic. Don't waste my time with your Greek manuscripts. I've got a Greek New Testament right there. I don't care nothing about it. I mean, I can go through there. I can see some words in there. I can... I know and I can read enough of it to know, you know, when I see the word Christ, Yesu, Christos, and all that stuff, I don't care nothing about this stuff. I believe I've got something superior right here. I believe that. And I'm going to die on this hill. You label me what you want. But that's where I'm going to stand. Right? I mean, how I many of y'all understand what I'm talking about? Why in the world do you worry about a Greek New Testament you can't even read? And guess what? It's just a New Testament. This ain't the Bible. How many of y'all believe this is the Bible? There's 39 books missing from this thing. That ain't the Bible. When you use the word Bible, it comes from the Greek, Biblios. It's a book. Amen? I've got the book right here. And I believe that book, I believe there's only one. And I got it. Listen, listen. When I say the Bible says, there ain't a one of you have to guess what I'm talking about. Now there's three different ones right here. The New King James, ESV, NIV. When I say the Bible, you don't have to guess. And you'll never hear me say, well, mine says it like this. Mine says it like that. 
when I say the book, and how many times y'all hear me say that? Sometimes I don't even use the word Bible. I say that book, the book, the book. I only mean one. Now you label me what you want, but it ain't going to affect me. I'll die on this hill if I die alone. I've spent 20 years with the book. Listen, man, I can tolerate a lot in this world. I can tolerate men who don't understand. I can tolerate people who have a little bit of different doctrine to me. I can tolerate a lot. You start messing with that book, man, and you're going to, there's nothing gets me madder than somebody messing with the words of God. That book saved my soul, showed me my Savior. That book showed my dad his, I've got the hope of seeing my dad again because of that book. Save my boy's souls. Save my wife. Save my mom. Not only that, Bill, gave me a bath, a daily bath. Over 20 years been washing me and cleansing me. Putting to death the sins of my body so that I can finally live unto God. 20 years that book's been doing a work in me. You mess with that book, man, and you're messing with the wrong thing when it comes to this preacher. Amen. Amen. I confess that I'm a King James Bible-believing heretic. Amen. How did Paul worship God? By believing all things that were what? Well, how can modern man worship God when he still ain't even figured out what was written? They've been at it now for 2,000 years and the college professors are still debating. You know how I know? You know what You know what edition of the Greek New Testament you're on from Nestles and Aylin? 20, 28th edition. They still don't know what's in there. Well, I'm beyond them. How can a modern man worship God by believing all things that are written when he's still debating what should be in there and what was written. It's what they call textual criticism. You see, that's, a, that's, that's wordsmith action, man. Right? You know, you don't, you don't call it fornication anymore. Right? You don't call it adultery. Nobody likes those words anymore. Right? You don't call it, you don't call it Bible correction. You call it textual criticism. Right? But what I want you to understand is this. They don't know what's written. It's settled for me. I have one authority in my life. And one authority only. And that's the book that I got sitting right here on this pulpit right now. I won't reference another one. I won't correct this one. You'll never hear me say a better rendering or a better way of saying it or another way of saying it or it should have said it like this. I believe the book I hold in my hand is pure from cover to cover. Amen. Now I want to describe to you my heresy. Y'all ready to hear my heresy? I believe this book right here is perfect. Yes, sir. And I believe this book right here converts the soul. Amen. Amen. I believe the King James Bible is right, and I believe it makes wise the simple. Amen. I believe the King James Bible is true from the beginning. I got an NIV right here. I can show you in five seconds that book right there ain't true from the beginning. That goes the same for the ESV. And the same for the new King James and the new American Standard and the revised version and the ASV and any other one you want to throw at me. I've been studying this one for 20 years. They're not even close. I've been studying that one for 20 years. I ain't found a single thing to get me tripped up. I can't study that one for 10 minutes without finding a lie in it. What did David say? Thy word is true from the beginning. What did Christ say? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Yeah. Well, it shouldn't be hard to find it, should it? I believe the King James Bible is true from the beginning and every one of its righteous judgments endureth forever. I believe that book right there is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. I believe that book right there, I believe... Everything in this book, all of its precepts are right 
and I hate every false way. I'm such a Bible believer. When God said the firmament was between the waters below and the waters above, I believe it. And you'll never hear me apologize for that book. Well, no, it's just speaking in a language. Oh, go sit down, man. You just got here 40 years ago. That book's been here for eternity. It's forever settled in heaven. And don't you dare think you have the audacity to stand up and critique and to criticize that eternal book. Because the moment you do, you've got too big for your, well, you've got to understand we know better today. And you've got to understand this, you've got to understand that. I believe everything God said in Genesis chapter 1 about heaven and earth. If I didn't believe it, I'd throw that book in the trash and I'd go fishing. If I've got to start correcting it in Genesis 1, you're going to find me correcting it in John 3, and therefore I don't have any faith in this book, I'm just going to go to the house. I believe this book is magnified above all God's name. I believe this book is pure. And those who add or subtract to it are all liars. Every one of them. PhD, THD, John R. Rice, Shelton Smith, those dear, good, old, sweet, godly, dedicated saints of God. The moment they started correcting and adding and taking away from that book, they all become liars. That's Proverbs 30. I believe this book is where faith comes from. I believe this book, this King James Bible, I believe this King James Bible is forever settled in heaven. Yes, sir. Oh, what a heretic. Yeah, that's what we're saying. That's what the message is about. Right? I believe this King James Bible worketh effectually in them that believe it. I believe this King James Bible was given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in right. You believe the King James Bible is inspired? See, everything people know about inspiration they got from a seminary or some preacher that the word's only in the Bible twice. Now, how can a man take take a subject That's mentioned in Job 32 and 8, 2 Timothy 3, 16, and write five chapters on it in a theological book. How much you want to bet that guy had a lot of material that he couldn't find out of a Bible? And so you're basing on whether that King James Bible is inspired or not on a bunch of rules you read from a seminary that made them up. I believe that book was given Given, I believe it's given to me by inspiration of God, and I believe it is profitable. Amen. I believe that King James Bible is more than capable of perfecting me and thoroughly furnishing me unto all good works. That's why you won't see me trying, you'll see me reading. You don't see me doing my best, you see me studying the Word of God. Because that's the only thing that can perfect me unto every good work. I believe the entrance of this King James Bible gives light. When Paul said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, I believe that's the King James Bible. I believe when that Bible says that, it's, it's, that God's word is a discerner of the intents and thoughts of the heart, I believe that King James Bible discerns the intents and thoughts of man's heart. When it says that the word of God is quick, I believe that King James Bible is quick. Amen. And I believe when that King James Bible is written upon your heart, it gives life to you and transforms you into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what that means? The image of God's son is right there. The image of the invisible God is right there. And when you correct it, you're corrupting the image of the uncorruptible God. And I won't stand for it. And I won't take you serious. That's God's image. Now, you know why, do you see why I called you an idol worshiper? You start correcting that book, you're an idol worshiper. I don't like this part about God, I'm going to change it. And before you know it, all you've got is a God you've created in your own imagination. Just like your forefathers did in Romans chapter 1. 
They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like an incorruptible man who changed, changed the truth of God into what? A lie. Where's the truth of God, guys? Oh, preacher, you're being mean. You're being mean. There's nothing meaner than a man correcting God's word. And if you don't like me calling it out, it shows you whose side you're on. I believe any departure from the King James Bible is a false way, and I, like David, hate it. I esteem all thy precepts to be right, and I hate every false way. And I believe you start messing with the precepts of that King James Bible, you're creating a perversion and a falsehood, and I despise and I hate it. Now let me let you in on a little secret. Y'all have all heard them. I, I grew up in church too. Now, the Greek says, I watched John, I watched Oliver B. Green, man, and God love his heart. I love Oliver Green. But he don't get off the hook. You know, they, these, these fundamental Baptist men, they all, they, all, they all ripped Charles Stanley up for years for using new translations. But boy, they let John R. Rice off the hook, didn't they? Bunch of hypocrites. Listen, man. Oliver Green in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, the baptism for the dead, this is what he said in a paragraph in his commentary. Now, what we cannot do, he said it's a hard to understand verse, but the only way we're going to understand it is to compare scripture with scripture and not make the text say what we want it to say. Very next paragraph, he doesn't compare scripture with scripture and then takes Greek authorities to correct the passage, so that it now resembles something he can understand. He broke the very thing he said he couldn't do. Yeah. Greek authorities tell us that when Paul wrote the original, there ain't a man on this earth that's ever seen the original book of 1 Corinthians penned by the Apostle Paul. Yeah. Now let me tell you something. Let me let you in on a little secret. Anytime you hear a preacher say, the Greek, when he says this right here, the Greek says, know one of two things about that preacher. He's either stupid or he's a liar. And there's no, other, there's no nicer way of putting it. I know this is language that people don't like. God calls them liars. Listen, man, most preachers in America today are professional liars. They went to seminary and learned how to lie, and now they've made a profession out of it. They're professional liars. I'm going to tell you something. A preacher that says that has either been taught to lie, or he don't know what he's talking about. Either way, you shouldn't take him serious. You say, why would you make a statement like that? Why would you make such a statement like that? Because there's no such thing as the Greek. No such thing. And I'm getting ready to tell you what I mean by that. Did y'all know prior to 1516 there was no Greek New Testament that you could hold in your hand? That's 1516 years, man. 1516, no there was a Bible in print before there was a Greek New Testament in print. The Gutenberg Bible. You, you, there was no Greek New Testament prior to 1516. And then a man named Erasmus come around. And I've, I've, this, is, this one right here is the, 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 the Biza text that the King James was translated from. But this, th th listen, Erasmus come around, what you had was thousands and thousands of Greek manuscripts. Erasmus come around, God started collecting them, reading them, got rid of the ones he knew were tainted and corrupt, compiled all the ones that he, he found acceptable, and put them into a book. You know how many editions of Erasmus Greek New Testament there was? Four. Now I can stop right there. If there's four editions of Erasmus's Greek New Testament, when your preacher says, the Greek says, which one's he talking about? 
Then a man come around, Stephanus, wrote four more. Then Beza, 10 editions of the Greek New Testament. That's 18 already. And then a family rose up around 1898 named Nestles. And I ain't even going to give you all the Greek New Testaments. Then another man added himself to it, Nestles and Aylin. They're on their 28th edition in eight, since 1898. That's a new Greek New Testament every four years for the last 100 years. So when your preacher says, the Greek says, he's either stupid or he's a liar. Let me tell you something. I've got three Bibles right here. You see them? Right? Get, uh, get Hebrews 3. Get Hebrews 3 in your King James. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Look in Hebrews chapter 3. We're not going to get into all the ways I'm a heretic this morning, but this one will suffice. Look in Hebrews chapter 3. Look down there at verse 16. For who, having heard, rebelled? That's a question. Are you ready? Indeed, was it not all who come out of Egypt led by Moses? That's the new King James. What does yours say? Yours says, how be it not all that come out of Egypt, right? Now, guys, they can't be any more different. Your text, your King James says it was not all that came out of Egypt that rebelled. This one says it was. Now, listen, all you need is one. Did Joshua rebel? What about Caleb? What about the whole generation 20 years and under that got to go into the land after all them died? Well, there's your new King James, but it's easier to understand. Right? Look at, the, uh, look at Romans 8.1. Romans 8.1. I'm making a point, man. You throw the definite article in front of something. The. That means that that has been defined. If I say the Greek, that means I'm talking about a specified Definite, defined thing. And I just showed you 46 editions of it. So how can you say the Greek ever again? Unless you're dumb or a liar. Look at, look at Romans 8.1. Now you see, you see why I called them dumb and liars? And I know dumb and stupid just drives people crazy today, man. But it's, some people are dumb. Look at, look at Romans 8, 1. It's just a fact, man. Look at Romans 8. And some of the dumbest people went and got a, paid $100,000 to become that dumb. It's the amazing thing about it. Look at Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's the NIV. Now, you're allowed to believe it. You're allowed to believe it. I think, I think yours has 10 extra words there, don't it? Yeah. All right. Here's the ESV. This is the one they're trying to... Every new Bible they come out with, finally. This is the one, man. This is the, and then two years later, they're promoting another. Look at, look, at, look, at, look at Mark chapter 1, ESV. You see, my King James has 10 extra words in Romans 8.1. That the NIV don't have. Now. I done told you where I stand on it. I believe my King James is pure. And any additions or subtractions from it. From it makes the ones who did it liars. That's where I stand. So I, I reject the NIV just on that principle alone. Here's the ESV. The more accurate one. The most accurate translation ever made. Look at Mark 1, 2. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. 
Yeah, good luck. I see some of you haven't been reading the Bible enough to even know what the problem is there. I bet you yours says prophets, plural, don't it? You know why your King James said prophets? Because he's quoting Malachi and Isaiah. Behold, I send my messenger ain't in Isaiah. It's in Malachi. It's Malachi 3.1. Now, let me ask you something. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger. Is that true? Then what is it? There it is. Being promoted by just about every major faculty of Christian. This is the men, this is the men educating the next generation of preachers. And you get upset at me for calling them liars and calling them stupid. These people, man, they get me fired up. And they'll be the ones that label me the heretic. Now, there's no such thing as the Greek. I can't use the word, the Greek, any more than if I believed every one of those was reliable. I could never again ever say the Bible says. Because I just showed you that they don't say the same thing. You know what you do? Two conflicting authorities. Boom. Conflict with that one. Conflict with that one. Conflict with that one. Well, who gets to decide? You do. You just pick the one you like. I'm sure you don't like Romans 8, 1. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Because the majority of Christians walk after the flesh. So I want a version that don't have those ten words in it. So I like the NIV better. It's more reliable. It's easier to understand. I'm sure it is. You understand where I'm at this morning? How could I ever set and promote four different books and then say the Bible? I've lost all right to ever use the phrase the Bible again. When I say the Bible, man, you know what I'm talking about. And it ain't some mythological Greek text that I've never held in my hand. Amen? You see this thing here? Got another one here. See this? That's written by Sam Gipp. It's a it's a it's him talking about the 26th edition of the Nestle's Greek New Testament. And you know what these you know what these good godly men did? You know what they did? They reintroduced 554 Greek readings from this one. This is the one your King James come from. Them men, after 25 editions of saying, oh, older and better manuscripts, older, better manuscripts, and correcting this one, and removing verses, and half of verses, and words, they neatly, in the 26th edition, realized how wrong they were, and reintroduced 554 of them back into the New Testament after 25 editions of ripping this one to shreds. didn't have the decency to stand up and apologize to the Christian world for trying to steal God's words from them for over a hundred years. You can have those thieves. If I'd been trying to steal God's words from you and realized I was wrong, I'd at least have the decency to tell you I'm sorry. And I definitely would have enough decency to never put out another edition of a Greek New Testament again because I wouldn't be qualified. They've made three since then. And the preachers are still standing up just slobbering all over themselves anytime they talk about it. You see, if you're a King James Bible believer, man, you get classified with the dumb briar hopping hillbillies like Lester Roloff and Maze Jackson and Tom Malone and Bob Gray. Yeah. Yeah. But if you get up and you talk about the areas, perfect participle in the present passive and all this other stuff, man, you get labeled in with James White and that crew. Yeah. Pick sides, man. I know where I stand. Hey, Amen. Mm-hmm. Y'all understand what I'm saying about this King James? Amen. 
But I'm not even a Texas, listen, this right here, the Texas Receptus, I'm not even a Texas Receptus guy. I'm not. I've got this book right here, man. If y'all want to come up here and try to read it, be my guest. I can't read it. I mean, I've, I've sat and looked at it. Like I said, I can go through and pick out some words. That ain't reading the Bible. So I'm not even standing up here debating over which Greek text is the right one. I'm a King James Bible believer, guys. When I talk about the Bible, you won't, waste, you won't see me waste five minutes of my time looking at the Greek or anything else. Not five minutes of my time. I won't look up a Greek word. Every now and again, you'll hear me, you'll hear me reference one or something like that. Guys, I believe this King James Bible right here. I'm not a Greek guy. I'm not a Texas Receptus guy. I'm a King James Bible believer. Now, you label me what you will. I confessed it to you. And I'm going to die on that hill, Bill. And I'll be dying with that book strapped on my arm. And by the time I die on that hill, hopefully that book's given me the breastplate and the shield and the armor and the helmet. And hopefully I've become an expert at using that sword. But I'm going to die on that hill with that book in my hand. That King James, found, that King James Bible found me, Bill. A dead West Virginia hillbilly, man. That King James Bible found me and showed me my Savior and justified me unto eternal life through the death of a man that died for me 2,000 years ago. You mess with that book, you're messing with something special to me, man. And there ain't enough PhDs in this world after what that book's done for me. You know how many times I've fallen? And since I was 11 years old, you know how many times I've fallen? If I told y'all things I did as a 16-year-old, y'all probably say, you ain't welcome to preach here anymore. If y'all knew things I'd done in my 20s, you probably wouldn't want me to preach here anymore. But I tell you this, <laughs> that book's got me where I'm at, and it's got me where I'm going. And there ain't enough PhDs in this world, enough Bob Jones graduates, or enough hot stuff preachers to get me off of where I'm at. And they're not going to knock me off this hill. When you find the truth, what did Solomon say? Buy the truth and sell it not. When you find it, there's not enough egotistical smart elks in this world to get you out of your truth. Oh, I don't like the way you're preaching this morning. Well, I told Bill, I'm preaching this morning. Amen. Look at 2 Timothy 2.15. So I'm like Paul, man. I believe all that was written. And guess where I believe it's written? I believe it's written in that AV 1611. Amen. I believe that book is the written words. The written words of the living God. Amen. Now you know where I stand. All right, you don't have to stand with me. Most people won't. Hey, man, they're scared of ridicule because it's going to get you labeled. Oh, King James onlyism. Yeah. Well, what's the? I mean, where do you? Where, let's let's hear your class. You don't believe in King James onlyism. Where do you stand? I'll wait. Easy belief. They they always put a label on. Oh, you believe in easy believism? What do you believe in? You believe in working to get to heaven? King James onlyism. Ruckman called it scholarship onlyism. Right? I mean, if you don't believe in the authority of that book, what do you? What's your authority? That's right. Amen. Look at Second Timothy two fifteen. Here's another way. I'll confess this one to you. I won't be too long here. I might, I might pick up with some of this next week, man. I, well, I don't want to tell you all that. You'll be, I ain't going back. He'll be mean. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, man. But look, look at 2 Timothy 2.15. Study. This is the next thing I believe in. 
Study to shew thyself approved unto God. How many of y'all believe that? I believe it. You know what that one says? That's the NIV. I ain't going to flip there and read it. Y'all, y'all, look, y'all stare at your King James Bible when I tell you what this one says. That one says study. It tells you something to do. Gives you something to do to approve yourself. You know what this one says? Do your best. Know what this one? You know what this one says? ESV. Know what that one says? Do your best. Know what that one says? The New King James. Be diligent. Be diligent to approve yourself. Don't tell you what to do. Go ask Cain how doing your best works out. Go ask him. We got enough people around this world trying to do their best. That's why you. That's why you got a hundred churches in Fairmont, and if you walk into the ninety-eight of them, you're more likely walking into a hornet's nest of lies and devils, because of a bunch of people doing their best instead of studying the very book God gave them. And you see how good Satan's is, Satan is when he come at the authority of God with Eve. He didn't deny God said something. He started casting doubt on the authority of what he said. Anytime a preacher gets up and says, older and best manuscripts say, let me put that in, let me put that, let me update that for you. You ready for it in a different, different way of saying it? Half God said. The majority of preachers today talk like serpents. You never heard Paul, James, Peter, John, Moses, Isaiah, or any of them talk like a modern preacher. The modern preacher sounds like the serpent out of the garden. Not like any Bible believer I've ever heard talk in my life. Now here you have it, your King James says, study to show thyself approved unto God. What does the serpent society say? Do your best. That's where that's where that's where that tree of knowledge will get you. Do your best, man. Give it your all. Do as do you know? Dream it and build it and do all that stuff, man. It's like Doctor Ruckman said. He said, he said, I, he, Ruckman said, I've read a book a day since I was a child. 20, he said, I think he said 24,000 books later. There's one book that stands alone from all other books. And he said, it's as if, he said the 24,000 books that he had read, he said, it's as if there was one spirit. Not, not the Bible. The spirit of this world had been writing through the pen of man. He said, for hundreds of of centuries. He said, and you can always tell it. It's plumb full of a bunch of positive thinking humanists. You can do it. Do your best. Be diligent. Right? That King James Bible is one of the most negative books ever written about mankind. It says you're altogether vanity. It says your body is vile. Oh, wretched man that I am. Amen. Their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues. They've used the seat. The poison of asp is under their lips. Now, how many of y'all believe that? Then why are you not more careful with your mouth? If you truly believe that the poison of an asp was in your mouth and in the power of your speech, you'd be careful with it. That's how God talks about man. Do your best. Just go ahead and do it, man. Cain did. And then when God didn't accept him, you know what he did? He killed Abel. We got a whole Christian world out here. This is where I'm heading with this thing. Got a whole Christian world out here doing their best. They get saved and they take on the music ministry, you know. 
25 years later, they're still strumming a guitar, writing little songs that make their heart feel good. And when they would come and hear Bible preaching like this, man, they'd get so bent out of shape, man. Who knows what they'd do to me? Well, I cut the grass down at the church for 85 years and jada da Just doing their best. They come to church once a week, go home. What happens to the book when they get home? Who knows? I don't know. I'm telling you, God gave you something to do to approve yourself to him. I believe... That that book I hold in my hand is the written words of the living God. And I believe if I want to approve myself to him, I have to study the words in that book. That's what I believe. I don't believe I have to do my best. I believe my best will never be good enough. I believe only that book can make me into something that God approves of for his work. All scriptures given that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every, all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Listen to what he says, rightly dividing the word of truth. See what's going to happen is we believe this, that sets us apart right there. And then we're not like the we're not like the fundamentalist man. Well, I believe this Bible's the word of God. And then you show them secret and spoken. Well, it's not rhetoric with me. I believe this book. I believe everything written in it, and I've been studying it for 20 years. And I believe, I believe this. But after 20 years of studying that book, I believe. That people like that, who take that book serious and study that book, after 20 years, they're going to be speaking over those who do their best. And you know what's going to happen? The religious world is going to take those men and do to them what they've always done to them. From the time Cain killed Abel until they took Zechariah and beat his brains out in the temple. And then they took Jesus Christ and nailed him to a cross. And then they took his servants and stoned them and crucified them and chopped their heads off. The religious world ain't, listen man, it wasn't the harlots and the drunkards treating the men of God like that. It was the religious fanatics of this world just doing their best. It was the Cains. It was the sons of Korah. You know what's going to happen? As I study that book to approve myself unto God, all the do-gooders, all the ones doing their best, they're going to hear the things I say. And because they've been strumming a guitar and waving their hands in front of a big screen in a church of 65,000 people every Sunday, when they finally hear the word of God rip out of somebody's mouth, they're going to label me the heretic. Go kid grandma. I'm serious, man. I'm being dead honest with you today. And y'all gonna y'all gonna have to, man, y'all gonna have to get rooted and grounded in this with me, man. Because the further we go, the worse it's gonna get out there. Oh, they believe this and they believe that. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. You say, I believe, I don't believe. Like, like a lot of dispensationalists believe, I don't believe 2 Timothy is teaching you how to study your Bible. I don't believe that. I believe 2 Timothy is showing you the fruit and the skill that comes from studying your Bible and it's the skill God wants in his workmen. And it's the ability to rightly divide the word of truth. God God didn't give you a book on how to rightly divide it, did he? He told you to study it. And you would be a workman that rightly divides it. I believe the more you study that book, the more you're learning how to rightly divide the word of God. So then when we get up and we draw charts like this right here, 
You know why we draw charts like that? I know, I know most Christians don't have any idea what we're doing. But you know what we're doing? That's the Bible rightly divided. We talk about the circumcision and the uncircumcision. We talk about the dispensation of, of, of grace to us Gentiles here. We talk about the mystery of Christ up here. The mystery of Christ. We talk about the 70th week of Daniel. We talk about the great the, the judgment here of the nations. There's another judgment out here at the great white throne. Right? Jeremiah 29. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. Y'all have heard it quoted. Why don't you read the rest of the chapter? That that's written about a people after they go through 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And the expected end being talked about is this one here. And it took, it's, there's still, Israel still hasn't received that expected end. Matthew 24, he that endures unto the, Hebrews 3, if we hold fast unto the what? Whose house are we? We are partakers of Christ. See, that end is something prophesied all the way back in Jeremiah 10, 14, but John Hagee and Paula White thought it was about them. Oh, Yeah. Man, we're so far ahead of them, man, they're never going to catch up. You say, what, a, what an arrogant thing. I wasn't the arrogant one. I was the one in my Bible study when everybody else wasn't crying and weeping over my Bible. If that makes me arrogant, man, then so be it. The arrogant man's the one standing up telling you what the Greek is. A man that thinks he's smart enough to correct that King James Bible after it's been on earth for 400 years saving sinners and giving them hope and cleaning them up and changing the hearts of drunkards and angry men. If you think you're smart enough to correct that book, big boy, you're too big for your britches. I mean, you still got preachers in this world that think John the Baptist started the first Baptist church in Jerusalem. Amen? And he tells you, I come baptizing to manifest Christ to Israel. And then he told you in Matthew chapter 3 that his baptism of water was going to give way to Christ baptizing the nation with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And what are we doing 2,000 years later? We're still fighting over water. And the writer of Hebrews even tells you that those diverse washings and baptisms were carnal ordinances imposed on them until, until, so there was a time, until the time of Reformation. That's what we call studying. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Paul says it back here. Galatians 3. The promises that were confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added. The promises came first. The law was added. But why was it added? Because of transgressions. For how long? Till the seed come to whom the promises were made. Right? So the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But before, but he says that we might be justified by faith, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. You see that? After that faith has come, there's no more need of the schoolmaster. You know what he says in Galatians 4? The child... Or the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from what? That's a Jew and a Gentile in the Old Testament. Did y'all know that? But as under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father, and when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of what? Sons. 
And then you know what he tells us Gentiles who are servants back here? And because ye are sons. And he says, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about Jews and Gentiles in the dispensational change. I believe that stuff, man. Amen. That skills developed after years of studying the Word of God. Look at 2 Thessalonians. I promise I'm going to shut up. Actually, get Ephesians 3. Let's do this one instead. Ephesians 3. Get Ephesians 3 and 1 Peter in one hand. Yeah, uh, yeah, we got one. It's called an AV 1611, bud. Go home and read it. Uh, and then I told you, I, I said I'm a preacher here for 13 years. When I first got saved, and he called and he found out that, that I believe in the mystery, he said, warn me. He said, well, brother, I love you. But you're going into a long course. Mm -hmm. Shame on you. He's been preaching now 50 some years. Look at, look at, yeah, this is, this is what I'm saying. The way which they call heresy. Well, let's just, let's just look at this. Look at Ephesians 3, 1. Then get 1 Peter chapter 1. In the other hand, we're going to look at some things. You see, we contend that Peter and Paul had two different ministries. Yeah. That's my contention. That's what I stand up. Probably using the wrong word. That's what I maintain when I stand behind this pulpit. I maintain that Peter and Paul had two different ministries. And I can prove that from Galatians 2. The apostleship was different. The gospel was different. And the one who wrought effectually in Peter for the apostleship of the, of, the, of the circumcision, the same was mighty in Paul to the Gentiles. Now, let's see if what I maintain is correct. Look at Ephesians 3.1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you what? If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to. And do y'all believe that? What if God didn't give something to Peter for you? You ever thought about it? Let me ask you something. The law given to Moses back here, was it for all nations? God didn't even make that covenant with the fathers of Israel. Moses says that in Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 6. Now, this dispensation was given to God for us, or given to Paul by God for us. What was it? How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Look at verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me, who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the what? Now do you believe that or don't you? Do you believe what Paul's preaching was unsearchable or don't you? Because if it was unsearchable, and you can go find it in Isaiah, then it wasn't unsearchable, was it? Paul said it was not made known in other ages. Therefore, what he's preaching wasn't searchable until he preached it. Now look at 1 Peter. Let's see if these two had the same ministry. Verse 9, 1 Peter 1, 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and. Now you say, I'm going to be the heretic when I leave here. Because I believe something searchable and something unsearchable is different. Amen. And I'm going to be the one that gets labeled the heretic. Look at what he says. You know what salvation the prophets prophesied of? Salvation of Israel. Paul said at Romans eleven twenty six, All Israel shall be saved as it is written, in contrast to their blindness during the mystery. That's Romans eleven twenty five 25, and 26. 
Now look at what he says. Who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Okay. Now there's, listen man, there's two different people. And I'm going to shut up, I promise you. There's two different people that are receiving grace. Peter said that the prophets prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Paul said the dispensation of the grace of God given to me, you word. So there's grace dispensed to Paul for the Gentiles and there was also a grace prophesied that was going to come to somebody. Are they the same? They can't possibly be. Because the grace that was given to Paul was unsearchable until Paul preached it. Paul's talking to these, or Peter's now writing to these Jews about a salvation that's been prophesied for them for all throughout their history. And those prophets back there, they would receive it and then search it. When Daniel's getting his information, man, it troubled him for weeks on end. He searched it, studied it. How did you think he'd come across the 70 years of captivity in Jeremiah? He was studying books. And he's reading it, searching it out. And this, this grace was prophesied. Well, yours wasn't. Look at verse 13 there. Let me put my notes up. Look at verse 13. I'm all hot, sweaty up here. Look at 113. Huh. I can go another 40 minutes now. Thanks, bro. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Look at, look at verse 13. <laughs> Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the... There's that phrase again. It shows up in Hebrews to Revelation so much and ain't even funny. Israel has an expected end. From Jeremiah. But he says, Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the what? Can y'all find that? There's a whole book in your Bible called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter is writing to a bunch of people who's going to receive grace when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming. You have a different day of hope that you're looking for here. You learned that through this apostle. Peter's just as much an apostle of Christ as Paul is. He just has a different ministry and different information to minister because it's according to Israel's program under prophecy. Paul received a dispensation of a mystery for us by which you Gentiles get to become heirs in accordance to something God had kept secret. I believe that. Yes, sir. And because I believe that, guess what? You can stand me, you can hear me stand up here and teach the Bible without contradicting myself. You can hear me stand up here and not be scared to teach on Hebrews 3, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10. Yeah. Oh, if we sin willfully, Hebrews 10, 26. One of the most misused passages in the Bible. The next time some, I just, I mean, let me tell y'all something. The next time somebody tells you that, if you're debating, because that's, that's the third heresy I believe in is eternal security. <laughs> but the next time somebody's arguing you about whether a man is saved once he gets saved forever, and they want to run you to Hebrews 10, 26, well, the Bible said if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, the next time somebody takes you there, you, you quote Hebrews 10, 30 to them, we know, we, for we know him who saith, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, I will repay. You quote that verse to him, it's Hebrews 10, 30, and ask him where it comes from. And when they can't, just say, nighty night, and go on about your day. You say, why? The writer of Hebrews is quoting the song of Moses, guys. That's not a small thing. The Song of Moses was recorded between God and Israel. It's a record between God and Israel. That when he punishes them for all their evil in the last days out here, that song is going to be a witness between him and them. And they sing that song in Revelation 15. 
It has nothing to do with a bunch of Gentiles living in the... The book is called Hebrews. And there was a song written all the way back there by God and put in, put in record so that when he punished Israel for their sins, that song would stand as a testimony between him and them. The book of Isaiah begins with that song. The first prophet, Isaiah, begins with the song of Moses. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. That's Deuteronomy 32.1. That's going to help you understand what's going on in Isaiah. God's about ready, start, he's about ready to start punishing his people Israel. And it's going to last for a period of 560 years, and it ends here. And Hebrews is taking you into the final phase of that. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The day of wrath, I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. See, we've studied. That's the point I'm making. We're not heretics. I trust that you shall know we are not reprobates. Amen. But I confess to you. I'm a King James Bible believing. Rightly dividing preacher. Amen. There's three more. We'll get to them next week. Amen. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. I, I just want to thank you for what a great day we've had here, Lord. I know I got fired up, mad, Lord. Just help these people to understand, Lord, that there's nothing personally at them. And if it is, Adam, Lord, and they just, I just, I just pray, God, that you would allow people to see my heart in doing these things. That there's not a mean spirit there. There's not an angry spirit. There's just a spirit of of, of of love for you and, and love for the authority of your word, Father. And God, I just pray that, that you would take these messages this morning, Lord, both of them, and that you would uh, edify the people out of them, Lord, help them to, to understand that the, that the King James Bible can be trusted, that it, it is the authority you've placed in our hands. You gave it to us by inspiration for the purpose of studying it, teaching it, and reproving and correcting each other and instructing each other out of this book that we could grow up together and become, become men that are perfected in Christ and furnished unto all good works. God, I pray that you keep everybody safe and bring them back safely at the next appointed time. We ask it all in, our, in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Mm.